Hello, and welcome to Become an Ambassador for Applied Behavior Analysis, Dissemination Efforts Beyond America and Autism. We are so excited to be here with you today, and we're so excited to be a part of the first virtual ABAI. We're also very thankful that you chose to take time out of your day to join us here at this symposium. We have an amazing lineup of presenters who are here with a wealth of knowledge that they're wanting to share with you. And we also have an amazing discussant who's gonna be able to tie all of that information together at the end. So again, thank you for coming. I wanna start by letting you know what we're here to do today, what's the purpose and what we'll be discussing. Then I'm gonna go into introducing all of our presenters and our discussant and then letting you know kind of our schedule for the end of the presentation. So first let's start with what are we here to discuss? Our symposium today outlines dissemination efforts in countries beyond the United States of America and in fields beyond autism. Our aim is to inspire you to become a better ambassador for applied behavior analysis. As an attendee of this symposium, you're, you are gonna be able to describe the responsibility that behavior analysts have to disseminate the science, and you'll be able to list a variety of ways to disseminate the science and become an ambassador for behavior analysis. You'll be able to provide an example of how behavioral skills training can be used in sports, specifically in football. You'll be able to describe the current status of behavior analysis in Africa and the United Arab Emirates. And finally, you're gonna be able to describe the current hashtag do better campaign. So now that we know what we're here to discuss, let's find out who is going to be providing that information to you. First, we'll start with, who am I? I'm Sharon True. I am a BCBA in Louisville, Kentucky. I work for an organization called Clinical Behavior Analysis, or we also go by CBA. I uh, am the Executive Program Director of this organization, where we provide a variety of supports for individuals in homes and communities and even in a center-based setting. So uh, I've been honored to ask to chair this, uh, this virtual symposium. And so I get the honor of introducing everyone uh, that's gonna be providing you information. The first person that you will hear from is Dr. Michelle Kelly. Michelle Kelly is a BCBAD, chartered psychologist, and associate professor at Emirates College for Advanced Education in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Michelle received her PhD in ABA from the National University of Ireland, Galloway, and has worked in the Middle East since she graduated in 2013 on the first verified course sequence in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Michelle runs two Facebook groups, ABA Ireland and ABA Middle East, which together have over 14,000 members. Michelle's paper today examines the current status of the dissemination of ABA in the United Arab Emirates in the Middle East. She includes an overview of efforts related to the translation of behavior analytic works and collaborations with non-behavior analytic professional peers. Following Michelle, you will hear from Dr. Merritt Chi. Merritt first became interested in behavioral science around 2012. Since then, he has received a PhD in Applied Behavior Analysis from the University of South Florida and currently resides in Tampa. Merritt's main research focus is on applying behavior analysis to sports-related performance enhancement. He has multiple studies published in this area, and he continu continues to conduct research in the Tampa Bay area. Merritt's paper brings us into the field of health and fitness, specifically football, with an evaluation of the antecedent and consequent components of the standard behavioral skills training procedure. Following Merritt, 
you will hear from Whitney Hamill Annie. Whitney is the co-founder and executive director of Autism Compassion Africa, an ABA nonprofit school for children with autism in Ghana. Whitney is a BCBA who has worked in service delivery across the US, UAE, Qatar, India, Ghana, and Nigeria. She is passionate about dissemination of ABA and help create the Facebook group ABA Africa to impact the lack of ABA services and resources on the continent. Today, Whitney's paper will discuss current growth rates of certified behavior analysts, barriers to dissemination, and avenues for support in Africa. Following the three presenters, you will hear from our discussant, Dr. Megan Miller. Megan Miller is the Vice President of Clinical Services for Life Trub. Megan inter excuse me, Megan earned her PhD in special education and behavior analysis at the Ohio State University in 2015. Dr. Miller's early training in behavior analysis occurred at the Cleveland Clinic Center for Autism as a volunteer slash intern in 2003. Since that time, she has provided services to over 100 children diagnosed with autism and other disabilities. Dr. Miller has taught courses in behavior analysis and special education as an adjunct professor for several universities. She has co-authored journal articles published in the Journal of Developmental Physical Disability, Behavior Analysis in Practice, and Teaching Exceptional Children. She also co-authored The Seven Steps to Earning Instructional Control with fellow BCBA Robert Schramm. Megan has provided presentations and trainings in behavior analysis to numerous professional organizations around the globe. In 2018, Dr. Miller started the hashtag do better professional development movement to improve access to training in best practices in the field of behavior analysis via a free online community, webinars, and a podcast. Today, Megan will highlight and integrate the contributions of all of the presenters in relation to and under the framework of her hashtag do better professional development movement. So as you can see, like I said, we have an amazing lineup that we're very excited to share with you. We wanna thank you again for coming to this presentation and for being a part of this symposium. Following all of the presenters and the discussant, we will be participating in the virtual uh, question and answers in the chat box within this symposium. So we're excited to be here. We're excited to share this information and we're excited to connect with you following all of the presentations. Now, I would like to get us started with Dr. Michelle Kelly. Thank you, Sharon, for the introduction. My name is Michelle Kelly, and today I will be speaking about dissemination efforts in the United Arab Emirates. The Gulf Cooperation Council, or the GCC, is made up of six countries, as you can see on this map, Kuwait, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, and Oman. The United Arab Emirates, or the UAE, is nestled between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Sultanate of Oman. So just some facts about the UAE. The population is approaching nearly 10 million people. It is the 93rd largest country in the world and it consists of seven emirates, the largest of which is Abu Dhabi, which is where I reside. The other emirates are Dubai, Sharjah, Fujairah, Um Al Quwain, Ajman and Ras Al Khaimah. The official language in the UAE is Arabic. And interestingly, only 10 percent are of the population are actually UAE nationals, which means that 90 percent of us are expats. So just an outline of my talk today. So I'm going to begin with the current status of what does ABA look like in the UAE today. I will then go through dissemination efforts 
um, including verified course sequences, conference presentations, translations, and survey results. And then I will um, conclude this presentation looking to the future of ABA in the UAE. But let's begin with the current status of ABA. So at the end of 2015, um, I submitted this review paper to the Review Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders with some of my colleagues, where we provided an overview of autism and ABA in the GCC in the Middle East. So back in 2015, when we submitted this paper, we reported that there was just 11 special needs centres that had at least one BACB certificate overseeing intervention. Currently, we count at least 22, the largest of which is the Mohammed bin Rashid Centre for Special Education, which is operated by the New England Centre for Children and is based here in Abu Dhabi. Um, there are also other well-known centres, such as the Carbone Clinic, which is based in Dubai. And we also have um, the Applied and Behavioural Training Institute, which delivers the competent learner model. Additional to um, these 22 plus centres, um, there are also private consultants who are also supervising intervention. In terms of the number of BACB certificates and RBTs, you can see that the numbers have risen um, most significantly in the numbers of BCABAs and BCBAs. So this is um, encouraging that there has been um, a significant increase in the number of behaviour analysts residing and working in the UAE. So how many of these BACB certificates are Emirati? So you can see here in this photo, we have two of our three Emirati BCBAs. We do hope the number of qualified behaviour analysts does increase over the next few years um, with the establishment of the first graduate VCS in the country in 2019. So now let's move on to discuss current dissemination efforts in the UAE. So given that we are now discussing dissemination, here's a quote from a paper um, that I wrote with our discussant in today's symposium, Megan and three other colleagues about dissemination. Um, and we said, behaviour analysts are responsible for disseminating behaviour analysis by making information about the science available to the public, professional peers and government officials. So now let's see the efforts that have been made by behaviour analysts in the UAE to adhere to this responsibility. One of the most important ways we can disseminate the science of behaviour analysis in any country is to establish verified course sequences so that we can, of course, um, qualify uh, local behaviour analysts. Emirates College for Advanced Education in Abu Dhabi did so in 2014 when they established the first BACB approved course sequence. This was at the undergraduate level. This undergraduate level uh, VCS has since been phased out, but starting recently in September 2019, we established the first graduate level VCS in the country. So we now offer a one year postgraduate diploma in ABA and a two year Masters of Education in ABA and across two different Emirates, Abu Dhabi and Ajman, and both programmes contain verified course sequences of ABAI. Another really great way to disseminate our science um, is to present at non-behaviour analytic conferences. And behaviour analysts in the UAE have done a really great job of this actually over the last year. Um, so here are some examples where there has been a presence of behaviour analysts, including an educational measurement, evaluation and assessment conference, an educational neuroscience conference, a teacher's forum, which was organised by the Ministry of Education. Another conference where behaviour analysts have had um, a big role to play is at the International Mental Health Conference. And this has really been a really excellent conference to disseminate behavioural principles. Um, and last year, there was even a three hour workshop on acceptance and commitment therapy, which was really well received by the audience. 
Also, at our annual Autism Day at Emirates College, um, there's always a big presence by behaviour analysts. This year, on, the, on April 30th, we delivered six free online webinars to parents and carers of children with autism. And three of these webinars were in English and three of these webinars were in Arabic. Um, and most of them were actually behaviourally based. So this is a really great way to disseminate behavioural principles, uh, principles to the public at large. Given that the official language of the UAE is Arabic, it is one of our dissemination goals to translate important behaviour analytic materials into Arabic. Last semester, I was teaching ethics to um, my undergraduate ABA students, and we were talking about dissemination. And as one of our in-class activities, we tried to generate some ideas for how we could disseminate the science in the UAE. One of these projects was such a strong idea that we ended up submitting it as a proposal for an international dissemination grant with the Dissemination of Behaviour Analysis Special Interest Group of the ABAI. And we were delighted to have been told that we were um, the successful recipients at the beginning of this year. So three of my ABA students, Fatima, Zubaida and Marwa, um, and I are working now to develop um, an Arabic resource hub. And here's Fat the, in this photo, you can see Fatima and Zubaida. So just to tell you a little bit about the goals of our project, our aim is to disseminate the science of human behaviour to the public at large in the UAE and indeed to all Arabic speaking individuals um, interested in behaviour analysis around the world. We want to provide easy to understand explanations of behaviour analysis and um, likely in the, the Emirati dialect of the Arabic language. Our plan is to publish short videos that describe and demonstrate ABA related materials. And I will tell you a little bit more about these videos shortly. We want to collate um, Arabic resources that are already available and just have them easily av available to the public at large in one place in one hub. We also want to be able to promote ABA related events and activities occurring in the UAE and indeed across the region. So in terms of our website, what's it going to look like? It's going to have multiple tabs, which will be specified to different groups um, of the public at large. So we'll begin with four tabs, one dedicated to parents, students, teachers and medical doctors. And the focus will be really on the publication of short videos, which will be created by my Arabic speaking ABA students. Um, and these videos will describe ABA related material. As I said, they'll be short and snappy. So this will allow widespread dissemination on social media platforms like Instagram and Facebook. Um, and some examples of video topics. So for example, for the parent tab, we might how to use a bedtime schedule or the bedtime pass. Um, for student tabs, how can we manage our time? So using effective behavioural strategies for time management. For the teacher tab, an example would be using the, the GBG in the classroom. For the doctor tab, um, recommending evidence-based interventions to parents. Um, yeah, so these are just some examples, but of course this is a starting point and we are really thankful um, to the DBA SIG for giving us this opportunity and awarding us this international dissemination grant, so thank you again. So I just mentioned there that we plan to have a tab specifically for medical doctors. And this was really one of the ideas for a research study um, that I completed with some of my colleagues. And we want to know, do doctors really know best? Given that doctors can usually be the first port of call for parents who may have some concerns about their children, we wanted to see, um, to assess the awareness levels amongst doctors in the UAE about um, all features of autism, as well as their awareness of the evidence base for interventions for autism. I conducted this study with my co-investigators, Dr. Binu George, who's a pediatrician, Nipa Bhuktani, who's a BCABA, um, and Dr. Shaljan, who's a statistician. And we conducted an online survey using eSurveys Pro and distributed to about 250 pediatricians um, who are all members on a specialist WhatsApp group of which Dr. Binu George is a member. We had many research questions, but the one I'd like to focus on today is how aware are pediatricians of effective interventions 
options for autism. And the reason we want to look at this is if a parent goes to their paediatrician um, indicating that they may have some concerns about their child, how aware are the paediatricians of the interventions that are currently available in the UAE? And are they recommending evidence-based uh, interventions? So we had 232 respondents, 70% of whom are currently practicing paediatricians in the UAE and 80% of whom reported that they've encountered a patient with autism. Now, when we looked at how they reported the effectiveness of interventions, um, we broke these down as per the National Autism Centre report in 2015. So here in this table, you can see those that would be listed or, or categorised under the established interventions. Um, so we have ABA, EIBI and PRT. And as you can see, there's um, the paediatricians did report that they largely found that these evidence-based established inter interventions are very effective or effective, which is good. In relation to emerging interventions, as per the classification by the NAC, um, we did again see some reporting that these interventions were very effective or effective, um, and these would include music therapy and PECs. So examining unestablished interventions, we did see um, quite um, a lot of support in terms of the effectiveness for these unestablished interventions, including facilitated communication and auditory integration therapy. And um, so, of course, this is of more concern. Now, of course, just because these pediatricians are reporting that they believe that these are effective does not necessarily mean that they are then recommending these interventions to parents. That will be um, something to, to investigate in future research, but it does give us a, an indication as to their awareness of the evidence base of interventions. We also looked at the Association for Science and Autism Treatment and their classification in terms of what doesn't work or is untested. And again, you're seeing some worrying results here where pediatricians are reporting that they deem the likes of chelation therapy, um, HBOT and psychotropic medication as being effective. There are other culture specific interventions that um, are anecdotally used by parents of children with autism here in the UAE. Um, and these include um, hijama or cupping therapy and the use of Epsom salt bath baths. And again, there is some um, uh, reporting that these may be effective. So again, it's just about, um, this is really a starting point for this, um, this research. And we really just want to see you know, the baseline of where our paediatricians are at so that we know how to take this forward in terms of increasing awareness um, of evidence-based interventions for autism. So we've looked at the current status of ABA in the UAE. We've looked at um, some dissemination efforts. So now let's look at um, the future of ABA in the UAE. So something that is actually ongoing right now is um, the establishment of a national behaviour analysis organisation. So we've actually submitted our proposal for an ABAI affiliated chapter, which would be called the Association for Behaviour Analysis United Arab Emirates or ABA UAE. So this is currently under consideration with ABAI. Um, if approved, we would then need to register this chapter in the UAE with the Dubai Association Centre, the DAC. So one of the missions of this chapter will be to help in the development of professional standards and help to ensure the licensure, a national licensure of behaviour analysts in the country. This is obviously a massive undertaking, but one really that's been, um, you know, in, in process for the last few years, but especially now given the, the recent announcement by the BACB, it's even more important now that we do develop this national licensure for behaviour analysts here in the UAE. 
It is our intention that uh, once um, we have this national behaviour analysis organisation, that we will formally request that new BACB certificates be made in, available in the UAE after December 31st, 2022. So that is our plan. One very exciting current development in ABA in the UAE um, is provisional planning with the Ministry of Education. And I would like to emphasize this is provisional um, at the moment, but the MOE is working on um, a very comprehensive well-being strategy. And we're currently looking at the role that behavior analysts have to play in supporting students, educators, and the, the system in enhancing well-being. So how this may look is we would have uh, different classifications of behaviour analysts, starting with classification one, um, who will be assistant behaviour analysts. These will be teachers. So we would hope to have a classification one behaviour analyst in every school, initially starting in Abu Dhabi and hopefully then um, running it across all Emirates in the UAE. But these assistant behaviour analysts would have at least a postgraduate diploma in ABA. These assistant behaviour analysts then in turn will be supervised by classification two behaviour analysts called qualified behaviour analysts. Now these qualified behaviour analysts will in turn be tiered in terms of some of them will have a master's in ABA and then there'll be a different tier where they will have their master's in ABA and will also have national licensure. In turn, these qualified behaviour analysts will then be supervised by board certified behaviour analysts. So these board certified behaviour analysts will have a master's in ABA with at least two years experience and they'll have passed an international board exam in behaviour analysis. And then again, in turn, they will report to classification four. Um, behavior analysts who will be situated in the headquarters of the Ministry of Education and the this behavior analyst or these behavior analysts will be doctoral level um, and board certified behavior analysts. Again, I'd like to emphasize that this is provisional planning with the MOE. The planning is in its early phase to incorporate what we are calling applied behavior analysts or ABAs into its well-being strategy. And the confirmation of the inclusion of behavior analysts in this future service model is yet to be secured. But hopefully the, real the future reality will align with the consideration being given to the matter. If you are interested to learn more about ABA in the UAE and beyond in the GCC and in the Middle East, I encourage you to join the ABA Middle East Facebook group. We now have almost 6,000 members. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. If you are interested to learn more about ABA in the UAE or the Middle East, please feel free to email me. My email address is available on the screen now. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll happily answer them in the chat function now. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Is it going? Is it, hello? Check. Hello? Okay. Um, hello, welcome to our symposium. My name is Merritt. Shank. <laughs> I can't believe we're doing a virtual conference. This is so cool. I had to do that because why not? So I'm really glad you all turned in, uh, tuned in, turned in, whatever, to this symposium, however you are sitting at home. Hopefully your pants are on everything's good. I uh, hope you enjoyed the first presentation. Like I said, my name is Merritt Shank and I'll be talking a little bit about uh, some recent research that I did involving uh, kids and learning how to tackle safely in football. And then I'll talk about, um, you know, kind of my approach to disseminating behavior analytic research outside of the ASD field. So first of all, why sports? Um, just to get into the numbers real quick, sports are incredibly important to people. People base their lives around this stuff. Um, it's, it's an important part to many, if not most people's lives. I'll tell you that over 75% of the people in the world will play sports during their lifetimes. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars are spent on sports, sporting activities, sporting events every single year across the globe. So, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a huge impact on people. 
Um, not to mention, I mean, and this is, you know, a biased sample, but the majority of conversations I've been having with people are individuals saying, oh, there's nothing to do. I can't wait for sports to come back with the coronavirus thing going on. I mean, we're sitting at home doing nothing and we realize, wow, you know, normally I would be sitting here watching a baseball game or something. It's just, it's, it's mind blowing when something that we've kind of taken for granted is quickly taken away. And then we realize how important it is. Uh, I'm also going to read a quote about sports. Uh, sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. So not only are sports incredibly important to people and play a vital role um, in the world and in each or many of our lives, um, but it just so happens that everything that an athlete does, everything that happens in sports is behavior. We all know that everything that we do is behavior. So why not go into sports? Because sports really provides us with a really unique opportunity in the natural setting because it's really close to an experimental setting already. It's highly controlled. There are rules and regulations, timers, people telling you when and when you cannot do things. It's really as close as we can get to an experimental setting in the natural environment. So being, I absolutely love sports and it's a huge part of my life. It was really the perfect um, situation for me to apply behavior analysis to sports so that we can disseminate um, ABA to a crowd uh, and individuals outside of the ASD field. And I want to be very clear right now that I am not saying anything bad about the ASD field because they have done some amazing research, research I use daily in my life with the clients I work with, a research that has changed the lives of countless numbers of people. So nothing against them at all, but this is just the field that I have chosen. And one way that I've found to further disseminate the field of behavior analysis in general. So when I first got into sports research, I needed to figure out what had been done so I could then decide what I could do to add to the literature. What we found when really delving into everything was there are four main types of interventions, but two main types I'm going to talk about for the purposes of this study. The first one is antecedent uh, interventions. These are obviously interventions that occur before the behavior and hopefully change the behavior. Uh, this involves stuff, things such as instructions and then behavior occurs. You set goals and then behavior occurs or you model the behavior and then hopefully the individual engages in the behavior that's been modeled. So antecedent intervention behavior, hopefully that works. If it doesn't, you also have consequent interventions. These are interventions that obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously, that occur following the behavior and hopefully change the behavior in an uh, acceptable way. These include feedback, public posting, self-monitoring, self and so on. So the behavior occurs, then you provide feedback to change the behavior. The behavior occurs, then you publicly post the results to change the behavior. Or the behavior occurs, and the individual monitors their own behavior and then sees the results and then seeing their feedback from themselves hopefully changes the behavior in a desirable way. So the big thing with the sports research that we found was, and we do this in our work with clients as well, they use package interventions, right? So they assess the problem and then they identify antecedents and consequences and they design these complex multi-component interventions to you know, look, look, address the antecedents and the consequences and then they throw them all together in one big intervention and they throw it at, there's a June bug in my house. <laughs> um, then they throw it at the individual and the good news is it pretty much always works with the athlete. But the bad news is from a research perspective, we're not really sure which component was completely necessary, if there were unnecessary components. Um, which components were most effective, most efficient, so on and so forth. So as of now, there really is little knowledge of individual components' independent effectiveness, you know, in, within that multi-component intervention. So what we did in this study is we assessed the effectiveness or efficiency of different components 
um, specifically instruction modeling as the antecedent components and feedback as the consequence, uh, consequent component uh, in the standard BST intervention. So we taught um, kids ages eight to nine how to tackle safely um, playing football. We used a local Pop Warner football field, which is about you know, 100 yards by 100 yards, roughly 100 meters by 100 meters for my uh, international crew there. Uh, we used a three phase intervention, so baseline intervention one, intervention two, a multiple baseline across participants design was used. We used a socially validated 10 step task analysis, so we didn't have to come up with our own because Sheree Atai and Ray Miltenberger uh, validated one in 2017. Well, it was published, I don't know exactly when they did the study. And um, importantly for this study, interestingly, we didn't have a secondary measure. So in sports research, you'll usually have a secondary measure. And the secondary measure is the overall outcome to see if the overall outcome of performance improved. So for example, I did a golf study where we looked at improving the golf form. So, you know, you approach the ball, you hold the club correctly, keep your arms straight, you bring the club back and keep your head still and you bring the club down and swing at the ball. And then hopefully the idea is you make contact with the ball and the ball goes where you want it to go. But that's the, where the ball goes is only a secondary measure. First, we wanted to make sure that we got the form correct before anything else was done. In this study, however, we didn't have a secondary measure because the last step on the task analysis was actually bringing the individual to the ground and making the tackle. So no secondary measure was really used. Um, for our method, obviously we start, well, I shouldn't say obviously, we started out with the baseline phase as most good research probably should. Then we moved into an instruction and modeling phase. Second, always we always went from baseline to instruction and modeling. In the instruction and modeling phases, there were three antecedent intervention trials after the, the intervention trials, there were three assessment trials. So for the intervention trials, the experimenter provided um, correct, they explained correct responding, and then they modeled correct responding based on the task analysis. And then they had the participant attempt to make a tackle based on the instruction modeling that were just presented. They did that once and then they repeated it twice for a total of three um, intervention trials. After those intervention trials were done, there were then three assessment trials in which the participant was told to try to, to make a tackle as they had just been instructed and shown. And those three trials are the assessment trials and they're the ones used in the results section and shown in the graphs. After the instruction modeling phase was done, so behavior leveled out or started to trend downwards, we then moved to the rehearsal and feedback phase or the consequent phase. Here, um, the structure was the same, so the, the participant attempted to tackle. There was no instruction or modeling or antecedent um, events provided uh, during this phase. But after the first tackle was attempted, then there was immediate feedback on what the, the individual did correctly and incorrectly based on the task analysis. And then they repeated that two more times, so they had three. Um, intervention trials and after the three intervention trials they then moved into the three assessment trials similar to the previous phase and again those three assessment trials were the trials that were reported in the results and shown in the graphs so overall what we found was all participants reached or approached mastery criterion following the consequence phase participant one at around 94 percent participant two around 95 percent and participant three, about 81% of the steps correct on average. Um, the study was cut a little bit short because of the end of the season, the end of the semester, everything going on, practices were delayed, so on and so forth. So that last participant qu didn't quite get up to where we wanted, but that was only because time was cut short. IOA ended up at around 86% in total and varied across participants. It's a little low for, um, what you oftentimes see in the behavioral research as far as the percentage of IOA goes, but it's still within the acceptable range and there's probably good reason why um, it's a little bit lower because the behaviors occur so quickly and oftentimes the researchers that are scoring these behaviors, um, although trained very well, uh, 
oftentimes are not intimately familiar with the sport that they are scoring. And that's just kind of the way it works sometimes. So here is a graph for participant one. On the y-axis, you have the percent of steps correct completed on the task analysis, and on the x-axis, you have the number of trials completed. So as you can see, they started out with about 50% of steps correct in baseline, and then they trended downwards. And once that trend was established, we switched to the antecedent part of the intervention. Here we see an overall, um, as far as average of steps correct done, correct, average percent of steps done correctly <laughs> in the antecedent uh, part of the intervention, we saw an increase, but then it started to turn downwards. So then we moved into the consequence phase. In the consequence phase, it took a little bit of time. But by the end, like the last six trials, they were consistently hitting 100 to 80% of the trials correctly. Um, there's an asterisk there. And the asterisk was actually what occurred during one trial. Uh, the individual that was tackled said his arm was hurt. And of course, safety is incredibly important when you're conducting research, uh, especially if you have to go through an IRB. Hint, you have to go through an IRB, so it's pretty important. I don't know who I'm hinting to. Hey, buddy over here. Um, but because of that, we actually changed the task analysis. We had to take the step of where they actually drove them to the ground. We had to take that out. Me and the coach decided the safety was more important than me trying to get the exact results and the, using the, the exact task analysis that I wanted. So in the middle of, the inter, uh, of this study, literally we had to change the task analysis. It's a huge, uh, you know, normally it's a huge red flag, but it's also one of the things that happen in research sometimes. Safety is important. Um, here is participant two. You can see their baseline is fairly similar. Um, they got around an average of about 30 steps correct over the course of baseline. Once we switched to the antecedent phase, we saw an overall um, improvement as far as average percent of steps correct. But by the end, they were starting to trend downwards by the end of that phase. So then we moved into the consequence phase. And for every trial in the consequence phase, this individual correctly performed 80 to 100 percent of the steps correct. Here's the third participant with whom we kind of ran out of time. As you can see, their baseline phase is low and pre pretty consistent. Uh, there is a slight improvement during the antecedent phase. Uh, but once we switch to the consequence phase, we can see that there was a gradual improvement over time. And by the last four trials, this individual was consistently getting 80 to 100% of the steps correct on the task analysis. So overall, what we saw for all participants, and I know I'm blocking out a little bit here. You can't really duck under anything. Um, we saw that the antecedent instruction modeling did help improve behavior a little bit, but really we needed that feedback quite a bit and nobody really reached mastery the mastery criterion until the consequences of feedback were introduced. Uh, for a social validity measure, we used a Likert scale um, questionnaire um, from one to seven. All participants reported enjoying the study with an average of 6.3. All participants scored direct feedback as a seven, um, being more effective than instruction and modeling. All participants reported also being a better football player after participation, so that was pretty cool. Some discussion points for this study specifically, um, feedback seems to be necessary once the behavior is at least partially within an individual's repertoire. So that's really important. You can't start with feedback if an individual doesn't know what they're doing. You know, not even in sports, just if anything. Like if I told, say, my imaginary kid to go change the alternator in my car and I didn't give him any instruction or show him how to do anything, he's going to go out there and piss his pants. I don't know what he's going to do. He's a kid, whatever kids do. Um, so you got to first... If they don't know what to do, you first instruct them and show them. But once they kind of understand what they're doing to some, I'm sorry, I'm using mentalistic terms of understanding things. But once they know uh, the, what to do, the behavior is partially in their repertoire, then you can give feedback and prompting and help really change that behavior into what it's supposed to be. Um, for limitations, there is definitely potential, and I'm not even going to say potential, I'm going to say there's probable, if not definite, um, 
poor, inconsistent, or inaccurate feedback. Whenever feedback is provided for a behavior that occurs in one second, you know, you're recording these individuals while they make a tackle and they start running each at each other and they make contact and within one second the entire behavior sequence is done. And then for feedback, the experimenter is supposed to jump in and go through a 10 step task analysis and 10 steps is short for a task analysis. Normally it's quite a bit longer. And they're supposed to tell them every step they did correctly and incorrectly in that task analysis when they just spent one second watching, you know, 10 steps occur. So people aren't perfect. They're going to make mistakes. And I'm sure it happened in this study. And I'm sure it's happened in pretty much every study that's used feedback for behaviors that occur very quickly. Um, in the future, we can maybe address this um, by finding ways to help perfect feedback, whether that's someone recording the behavior and then recording the feedback and then providing the individual that gave feedback with feedback on their feedback. I don't even know if that makes sense. I feel like I'm an inception or something, but whatever. Um, another a limitation in this study would be um, potential order effects. And of course there were gonna be order effects. You know, we started out with the antecedent intervention instruction modeling every time before we moved into the consequence intervention. So yes, they got instruction modeling before there was any feedback given and the instruction modeling as shown in the data changed the performance for all participants. So there are order effects. These can be addressed in future research by, you know, any number of ways of however you want to, you know, mix up the orders or do a group design, whatever anybody wants to do, it can be done. So that would be pretty cool. Now some general discussion points for sports research in general. First of all, I'm guessing most of the people that are watching the symposium have been a part of sports uh, and interacted with a coach in some way. And most coaches think that they pretty much know what they're doing. That's why they're the coaches. And when, you know, some little shit behavior analyst walks up trying to tell people what to do, well, let me show you how to actually tackle safely here. <laughs> then the coaches, uh, basically, they don't want to deal with it. They know what they're doing. They think their coaching strategies are effective. And so you got to understand that going into it. Make sure you're not stepping on any toes and getting off on the wrong foot. Strange foot metaphor there. But, uh, you know, you, you want to make sure that you come in with something that will help them. But at the same time, you're not going to get in their way because they have a limited schedule to do the things that they want to do, which goes into time concerns. There are time concerns in the coach and I'm in sports research. I ran into them with this study. The season ended. The, the weather turned bad. Tampa is the Latin capital of the United States. Practices are delayed. Uh, games, practices are postponed, canceled. All these things happen and you run out of time. And so you have to make sure you got your shit together before you go in and start thinking you're just going to rock out this study like that because it usually doesn't happen. Safety is another thing I ran into with this study. You know, and a kid reported being injured. He was completely fine, so don't worry about it. He had absolutely no injury, but he reported being hurt. And so we actually had to change the task analysis in the middle of the study to make sure and ensure the safety of the participants because that's really, I think that's the most important thing when doing research is that you're always doing doing less harm than you are doing good and if our participants are breaking arms and stuff i i don't know if i can justify my research too too well um there something you'll notice in sports research you don't always notice is there are high baselines so most research you'll see starts out at zero if it's a behavior you want to improve and then ends at 100 or if it's a maladaptive behavior it starts at 100 and it brings it down our intervention brings it down to zero in sports research, the individuals already have the behavior partially in their repertoire, so it normally starts somewhere around 30, 40, 50% of what you're wanting. So it's, it's just what, what happens in sports research. It doesn't mean the intervention isn't as effective as in other fields. Um, participant maturation does occur. The difference between a seven and an eight, nine, 10 year old is like a whole foot. You know, the kids grow pretty quickly. And that's something you have to consider and you got to try to move through these studies fairly quickly. And then also reinforcement in sports is kind of inherent. So it's hard to program reinforcing contingencies 
that are more reinforcing than what's already in the sport. You know, if I'm playing basketball and I shoot and I get that bucket, that's, that's the most reinforcing thing to me. I don't care if the coach, Hey, good shot, buddy. I'm like, yeah, I know it was a good shot. I scored points. And I got buckets. So that's, that's kind of something you got to consider when developing a sports intervention. You're not going to go in and change the game. You got to go in and use behavior analysis around the game that exists. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about dissemination real briefly, then I'll get out. So I saw this joke the other day and I had to put it in here. Why can't a tennis player ever find happiness? Because love means nothing to them. Ha 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 ha. Literally the punniest joke ever. So I had to put it in, but it was the smoothest transition I could think of to say that if, if you want to disseminate behavior literature, behavior analysis to individuals that don't already have contact with it, the first step is find something that you love to do. Every here's it's not rocket science, it's behavioral science. Hey, -o. um, all you got to do is find what you love and then apply behavior analysis to it. Um, if you are doing work in a field that you just do not enjoy, it's going to show and nobody's going to want to be a part of it. You have to find the things that you love, apply behavior analysis to it, and then it's going to be great. That's what I did with sports. And the first step, no matter what research field you're going to want to get into, is you got to delve into the literature. You got to become intimately familiar with this stuff. So you know everything that's been done. You know all the holes in the research. You can identify what's been done, what hasn't been done, and you can start contributing yourself. Without doing that, you're just kind of going about research all willy-nilly. Um, this, this is a paper I published with my friend Raymond Miltenberger. It was a three-year project. We found about 100 studies that have been done um, in, sports, in sports performance using behavioral measures. And that's not a lot. I mean, it was hard to find several of them. And it's a fair amount of studies, but it's not a lot compared to some of the other fields. So whatever you decide to do work in, Become familiar with that literature. Make sure it's something you love. Get into it. Get your fingernails dirty. And then go out and start making the world a better place. I always have to show this graph when I'm talking about disseminating research. So this is just a standard deviation. I, don't, I can never be a what. I don't know how to. Whatever. Um, here is normal ABA research. We only contact with, with most of our research. We only contact some of these people here, right? It's some of the marginalized population but the most most people I don't know whatever most people are they're in the red right these are people that bleed red eat food uh breathe oxygen uh whatever else I don't know they're the normal people and a lot of the ABA research doesn't do anything for them it doesn't contact them and that was a big part of when I was getting into sports research I thought hey this literally almost everybody plays sports or watches sports so that's perfect Let's do some research about sports, the thing that I love. I'll be able to get it out to there to other people, and we can all bond over this cool research that's being done um, on things that we all enjoy. So that's another thing to consider if you're wanting to disseminate to a larger population, um, the research that you're doing. Oh, yellow box, cool. So this is my email. Feel free to contact me with any questions or any comments, or if you want to copy this presentation, whatever. Um, feel free to email me. I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Not going to say for sure how long that's going to take. Um, real quick, because I'm sure my uh, mentors and advisors are pissed off at me for dressing so casually, but I'm in Tampa in my house, in my living room. Yes, I'm wearing a hat, but the reason I'm wearing the hat is, uh, this is, I don't know how to do this camera thing. This is an old Kansas City Monarchs hat. Kansas City Monarchs were a baseball team. They were a Negro League baseball team um, when American sports were segregated. When America was segregated, um, African Americans weren't allowed to play sports with white people. Racism, bigotry were prevalent, except well, more prevalent um, and accepted and normal back then. And it's crazy because greats like Jackie Robinson, Satchel Paige, uh, Buck O'Neill, uh, a lot of other uh, African Americans donned this hat, not this exact one, but this hat right here. And they donned it with pride 
and it looks freaking cool in it. And so I'm wearing this hat uh, as a shout out to them to represent that not only in behavior analysis, but in what I just talked about with, I mean, we've come a long ways in the last 50, 60, 70 years for equality and rights for everyone, but we still got a long ways to go. So let's keep fighting. Let's keep doing the good work that we're doing. Let's keep doing the good research that everybody's doing and uh, we'll go from there. So I'll end with a quote and that'll be it. This quote is from Nelson Mandela. Sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. Thank you all so much. Um, I really appreciate it. Y'all be safe out there. I hope to see everybody again soon. I'm going crazy here. I will see you all later. Ma! Milo! Now! Hello. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Whitney Hamill Annie, and I'm here in beautiful Ghana. I'm going to be discussing growth and barriers to dissemination of applied behavior analysis in Africa. I will cover an overview of Africa, including population, prevalence of autism spectrum disorder, and awareness and acceptance of autism spectrum disorder. The current growth of BACB certificates over the past two and a half years in Africa, barriers to certification, Autism Compassion Africa's model for sustainable growth, and ways you can support dissemination on the continent. The African continent holds a population of 1.3 billion individuals. That makes up 16% of the world population. Not only is Africa a large land mass, but it holds a great, it holds great diversity of cultures, ethnicities, and language. To give you an understanding of the size, the area of West Africa is roughly the same land size as the United States of America. Current CDC statistics on the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder in the US are one in 54. In Africa, there is no known prevalence at this time. Lack of data on prevalence has also resulted in limited funding for programs for those with disabilities and further research and funding is needed. If we use the CDC statistics of one in 54, and applying that to the population of Africa, there would roughly be 24 million individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Not only are services limited to those who are in need, but there is also a large stigma against those with special needs such as autism and other disabilities. Children sometimes are seen to be curses, demons, or witches. The following quotes are taken from a UNESCO report, Access to Education for Students with Autism in Ghana, Implications for EFA by Anthony. A senior professional at the national level is quoted, they are thought to be not whole, not normal, sick. They are thought to be cursed by the gods, bewitched if you will, also, it is thought that they, the families, are being punished. When they are born, there is no reception for them. There are, there are a lot of misconceptions. A parent said, what people will say, that is more of a killer than the disease itself. What people will say, and it could affect the whole family. Maybe nobody might marry into the family. Another parent was quoted saying, if there is anything abnormal in our society, we attribute it to witchcraft. 
and a community member was quoted saying, maybe your parents did something bad and they were cursed by somebody and you are being suffered for that. At Autism Compassion Africa, we have seen firsthand our students being harassed by community members, as well as one student was actually burned by a family member and called a witch. The Human Rights Watch also released a 2012 report titled Like a Death Sentence, Abuses Against Persons with Mental Disabilities in Ghana. The 84-page report details the terrible conditions those with disabilities face in Ghana, including forced isolation, unsanitary and overcrowded hospitals, being chained to trees and beds in prayer camps, verbal and physical abuse, electric shock therapy, as well as forced fasting. A BBC report from 2015 titled, The Worst Place in the World to be Disabled, detailed the conditions of those living at prayer camps and in isolation at homes. The reporter, Sophia Morgan, also visited a fetish priest who admitted families, the, the fetish priest who admitted families bring him their disabled children and he drowns them in the nearby river to release their evil spirit. So now I'd like to discuss about the growth of BACB certificates over the past 2.5 years. I first moved to Ghana in August of 2017. At that time, I was the only BCBA listed on the BACB registry in West Africa. To remind you, West Africa is roughly the same size as the United States. Imagine being the only BCBA in the US and all of those children with autism, uh, be, <laughs> the, you being the only BCBA for all of those children. So the following graph displays data collected across the previous 2.5 years by accessing and recording BACB certificates in Africa from the BACB registry. These numbers were then shared on the ABA Africa Facebook page. I first looked at the numbers of BCBAs in October of 2017, and there were eight BCBAs on the continent. I did not look up BCABAs at that time. Later, when we, when we were opening uh, the ABA Africa Facebook page in June of 2018, there were 11 BCBAs and five BCABAs, totaling 16 certificates. In April 2019, there were 12 BCBAs and, sorry, in October 2018, there were 12 BCBAs and four BCABAs, totaling 16. In April 2019, the numbers remain the same of 12 BCBAs and four BCABAs. By October of 2019, there were 16 BCBAs and five BCABAs, totaling 21. And most recently, in April of 2020, there were 21 BCBAs listed and four BCABAs, totaling 25 certificates on the continent. I then took the current data from the BACB registry as of 30th April and added it to the map. There was one BCBA in Algeria, one in Botswana, five in Egypt and two BCABAs, three BCBAs in Ghana, three in Kenya, one BCBA and one BCABA in Nigeria, two BCBAs and one BCABA on Reunion Island, one BCBA in Senegal, and four BCBAs in South Africa. When looking at the population of Africa, 1.3 billion, 
there would then be 52 million individuals for every BCBA or BCABA in Africa. 52 million for one BCBA. But if we also apply the recent CDC prevalence rate of one in 54, that equates to almost one million individuals with autism for every BCBA or BCABA in Africa. Let me say that one more time. If we also apply the recent CDC prevalence rate of one in 54, that equates to almost one million individuals with autism for every BCBA or BCABA in Africa. As we can see, the need is high and the growth is slow for BACB certificates. There are many barriers that are preventing passionate individuals from studying ABA and becoming certified in Africa. Currently, there is only one verified course sequence for BCABAs, and that's in Nigeria, and there are none for BCBAs in Africa. The cost of online coursework can be much higher than salaries, therefore creating a financial barrier. Supervision and the exam can also be costly. For example, the average teacher's salary in Ghana is around 400 US dollars a month. Even if someone is able to take online coursework, there are then limited ABA companies to be able to gain experience hours needed to sit for the exam. There are also very few BCBAs to provide in-person supervision. And to top it off, there are no approved testing sites in Africa. To take the exam, the person would need to apply for a visa, which may or may not be approved. A lot of us in the States don't understand how difficult it might be to get a visa just to travel to another country to sit for the exam. They would also need to fly to the other country and cover all travel expenses, including the flight, the lodging, and the food, which also would be quite expensive. So as you can see, the barriers are many. I will share a little bit about Autism Compassion Africa on the next slide, but I wanted to discuss our approach for breaking down these barriers. We are currently building local capacity with local staff as we, as we go to create sustainable future for ABA in the region. We provide scholarships to our staff. Three in Ghana and two in Nigeria just completed BC ABA coursework at Florida Institute of Technology with full scholarships from Autism Compassion Africa and their supervision by our BCBAs was also included. ACA also provides additional supervision for those studying for BCBA or BCABA in the region who are not Autism Compassion Africa employees. To give you a little more information about ACA, we are a 501c3 nonprofit in the US and a Ghanaian NGO founded in 2016 with our doors opening in 2017. We operate an ABA day program for 14 students in a one-on-one -on -one setting in Cape Coast, Ghana, which is three hours outside of the capital. This program is highly, highly subsidized for families. We also provide consulting with schools and families across West Africa to disseminate ABA as well as provide funding for the center in Cape Coast. ACA has three focuses to sustainable ABA services in the region. Direct services, which I mentioned above. Autism awareness to combat the human rights violations discussed and continued education to support ABA dissemination in Africa. Our mission reads, ACA provides breakthroughs for children with autism 
and their communities in Ghana through the application of evidence-based applied behavior analysis. In addition, we provide world-class training in ABA for staff, families, and the community, supervision and support for those seeking BACB certification, as well as promote autism awareness across the country. So how can you support ABA dissemination in Africa? Consider sponsoring coursework or providing scholarships for individuals interested in studying. Support current ABA programs in Africa who are building local capacity. Mentor current BCBAs in Africa. Many may be newly certified and could use support. Consider providing supervision at a reduced cost for those studying. To connect with those working in Africa and potentially look and who are potentially looking for support, follow ABA Africa Facebook page. And finally, move, but be careful to do a thorough needs assessment, study the culture, and look to partner with locals on the ground. To summarize, there are currently 21 BCBAs and four BCABAs in nine African countries out of 54 countries. There is no known prevalence of ASD in Africa. If we estimate using the CDC statistics, there would be roughly, there would roughly be 24 million individuals with autism in Africa. It is estimated that there would be almost 1 million individuals with autism for every one BCBA or BCABA in Africa. The barriers are high and the growth of BACB certificates is slow. Finally, there is a great need to support dissemination efforts and break down barriers. Thank you so much for joining us today and I hope to connect with you to discuss ABA in Africa. You can reach me at Whitney at AutismCompassionAfrica.org. Thank you. Thank you to each of our presenters for such a wonderful symposium. My name is Dr. Megan Miller, and I will be leading the discussion for our symposium, Become an Ambassador for Applied Behavior Analysis, Dissemination Efforts, Beyond America and Autism. I would like to thank Michelle Kelly for putting together this incredible symposium and to my co-presenters, Whitney Merritt for presenting their information as well and to Sharon for chairing this symposium. It has been wonderful virtually creating this with all of you. So for the discussion, I thought it would make the most sense for me to give a little bit of information about who I am and why I was asked to be the discussant for this symposium. And then I will touch on each of the different symposium presentations to give some of my thoughts about it and pull everything together. And when we're finished, we will have time for questions. So just a little bit about me. I am a board certified behavior analyst and I have my doctorate in special education. I have been providing international services for 10 years, so it's hard to see because of the video, but I have worked in the UK, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, the Middle East, North America, and South America. I focus heavily on collaborating with BCBAs and autism professionals in numerous countries. And I started the Do Better movement in 2018, where we have over 94 countries represented throughout the world. So it has grown quite rapidly, and we're really excited about the variety of people participating within the Do Better movement. Just a little bit about the movement. It's a professional development initiative for behavior analysts. So the activities that we engage in focus a lot on behavior analysis, but we also focus on doing better in our just day-to-day -day lives as well. I personally do work in the field of 
autism. So in terms of the symposium title, I don't really go beyond autism, but I do try to help people see where we can learn from each other as behavior analysts and improve the work we're doing, regardless of what setting we're working in. Some lessons that I've learned from the Do Better movement over the past two years, now we're entering our third year. The first relates to worldwide advocacy. So I didn't necessarily know that this would be a big part of the movement for me. My main goal when starting the movement was to really just get information out to behavior analysts of parts of our science that I didn't see being used regularly in practice that would really improve effectiveness of services and services being provided in a way that's most humane and ethical for the individuals that we're serving. However, as I started putting out more and more information, I had people contacting me from around the world with information about the services in their country or the state of the science where they were living. And I was able to learn from not just the people living in the different areas that I was encountering, but also from others who have been working in those areas as well. Some of the barriers that they faced and some of the lessons that they've learned as well. So one of the big take homes for me was when I was able to spend some time with Molly from the Global Autism Project and the focus on do with, not for. In Whitney's presentation and in Michelle's presentation, they both talked about the local sort of state of affairs. So Whitney talked about in Africa, specifically more so in Ghana, and Michelle talked about in the UAE. And one of the things that Michelle really pointed out was there's been a really big rise in certified individuals in the UAE, but there's only three Emiratis who are certified. So when you look at the growth locally for kind of the, the local culture that's there, it's not been as big as just people infiltrating from other countries. Not to say that that's like a good or a bad thing, but it is something to be aware of that are we building local capacity for the areas around the world. And Whitney also mentioned something similar. When she first moved to Africa, there wasn't very many board certified individuals and then it's grown, but there's a lot of barriers to having it grow within the communities in Africa and having people who are born and raised in Africa and the different countries there becoming board certified or learning about behavior analysis for themselves. What Molly learned with the Global Autism Project that really has impacted me and inspired me when looking at disseminating behavior analysis is that advocacy works best with partners on the ground. And I really liked in both Whitney and Michelle's presentations how they talked about working locally with the, um, Michelle's working with the university there, and she mentioned some other people that live in the UAE that she's working with. And I'll talk about that more in my discussion on her uh, presentation. And then Whitney discussed as well how she started the scholarship program to help build capacity within Ghana and other parts of Africa, hopefully, if Autism Compassion Africa gr continues to grow. And interestingly, Merritt also talked about this too, when he talked about working with different sports, if you work with the coaches and you have to work with the sport that you're trying to improve the performance of the athletes. You don't get to just come in and say whatever you want as the behavior analyst. So each of the three presentations on dissemination focused around this advocacy working best with partners on the ground. And this is definitely a big lesson I learned when I first started providing international services. I obviously worked with the families that I was providing services for, the people that I was supervising, but I didn't really have partners on the ground that I could connect them with or that I had built a network around. So it was difficult if we, for certain issues that we would run into. I also learned pretty quickly that certain families that I was trying to serve, if there wasn't an individual as part of that team who could serve as my partner on the ground and took initiative and really 
went forward and, and either pursued behavior analysis as a career or at least, you know, interacted with me on a regular basis and executed the different programs that we talked about, we didn't make as much progress. So whether you're working and serving a team or you're physically living somewhere or you're trying to go out to a place regularly to help support them, having partners on the ground is really important for quality dissemination efforts and just developing those, those long partnerships that can get stuff done. Another thing that I've learned is to solve their problems, not come in with your own ideas of what problems need to be solved. So again, that goes back to the working with the do with, not for. Whitney highlighted quite a few barriers within her presentation specific to Africa, but potentially and other parts of the world as well, especially around the stigma. If you're in an area where there's a huge stigma around the populations that you're trying to serve, that's going to influence what you're doing with your interventions and how you're promoting behavior analysis in that area. It's going to be a lot different there versus somewhere where that's not the case. So it's really important to understand whichever part of the world that you're trying to work in or whatever population you're trying to serve, what the issues are that they're facing and not just come in with your own ideas as the behavior analyst. Lastly, another thing that I learned from a worldwide advocacy standpoint is to resist the urge to do trainings on the fly or replicate rigid models. So I've, both from Mali and in my travels to each of the different countries that I've been to over the last few years, learned a lot about these trainings on the fly where I think people have the good intentions to come in and help put out a little bit of information, a few nuggets, if you will, of helpful, you know, something's better than nothing. But if you do that in places where there isn't any type of capacity to carry it through, and you don't have anyone on the ground to partner up with to make sure people really understood what you were training them on, then that's really not going to be beneficial for everyone. Because we all know, and Merit's uh, presentation highlighted this really well, that we need to have really effective training. Behavioral skills training is where it's at. So having that the antecedent strategies with the, the modeling and the rehearsal, and then the feedback is really crucial. So if you just come in and do a day long or a couple day long training or even an hour training for someone and you're not there to carry through that whole piece and you don't have anyone to carry through an effective behavioral skills training type model after you leave or provide any type of booster training, then it's likely that the, the different content that you trained on is not going to be implemented effectively. And it could do more harm than good, especially if, if there's areas where, again, there's like different stigmas in place right now. You may see things be applied in a way that takes us back to like the days of behavior mod where people kind of got the framework and grasped it a bit, but didn't get the positive side of it. And they start applying the power of our science in negative ways. And the replicating rigid models is also something that I've seen quite a bit when I've looked at dissemination. It can be easier, it's less response effort to rapidly train people up on like very rigid black and white. This is how we provide intervention. This is how we prompt. This is how we reinforce. These are exactly what the programs need to look like. Every learner needs to use these stimuli in this room with this amount of time, but that doesn't really meet the socially valid aspect of our science and it especially isn't culturally competent right it's not if you're replicating a rigid model that was designed in the united states that's not necessarily going to be appropriate for the different areas that you're working in and especially if you try to replicate a rigid model with a population that's different from where the model was created in the first place so like Merritt mentioned in his presentation it's not like you could take some rigid model from behavior analysis and go to a baseball field or a football field and say, okay, this is what we're doing. You have to work with the coach, with the team that you're trying to, to improve the performance of the athletes. The same idea should be in place with any population that we're working with. We come in and work with them to create the model that works best for those learners in that environment. Seeing on how you can do better with whatever it is that you're learning about within the field of behavior analysis. So as I've already mentioned, never stop learning. I love this quote, be teachable, you're not always right. We don't know what we don't know. 
And, you know, watching Michelle and Whitney and Merritt present for this symposium, I learned a whole lot of new information that was really helpful. And I'll be talking about that in a few slides. But in addition to the ideas around dissemination and how we can disseminate, there's a lot about human behavior that we don't know. And obviously we're all watching these webinars and not attending ABAI in person because of a whole new world of things that we now have to navigate relating to COVID-19. So there's a lot out there that we don't know and we need to be willing to learn more about it. And that's really important when you're looking at disseminating, again, whether it's working with different cultures and different parts of the world or different populations and different contexts, we need to be open to learning from the people that we're working with. ABA is a science and is therefore progressive. That's the name of one of my favorite articles by Justin Leaf and colleagues. If you haven't ever read it, I highly recommend checking it out, but it, it's true. <laughs> so there's things that were discovered in our field many, many years ago, and those are wonderful things, but we should constantly be pro progressing forward and learning more and doing better as our science progresses. And we have to be willing to go beyond. So go beyond what you were initially trained to do. Go beyond your history and how you've always done things and be ready to improve upon, even if you're already making really effective gains and you're serving the populations you serve really well, you can always go beyond that. So now I, I will touch base, um, discuss each of the different presentations that happened before closing out and concluding the discussion part of our symposium. So the first paper was with Dr. Michelle Kelly and she talked about the work that she's doing in the UAE and the research that they did with doctors. So when I looked at Michelle's, when I viewed her presentation, one of the things that really stuck out to me is how important it is to be a doer when we're talking about dissemination and being an ambassador to behavior analysis that goes beyond America and goes beyond autism, being a doer will definitely get you far. We can all have really great ideas, but if you don't take action on them, it doesn't really help a whole lot. One of the things I learned about last year with the Global Autism Project, they had a summit in Bali. So that was one of my favorite trips that I took was the Compass of different styles that people have. So I learned that I'm an action person, which should not surprise anyone who knows me. There's different types of people, and I know this probably doesn't sound very behavior analytic, but there is research behind this compass. So there's, you can have a combination of these things, but the idea is there's action people, visionaries, analytical people, and empathetic people. So again, you can have a combination of those. Uh, Michelle comes off to me definitely as an action person. You may be a visionary or you may be an analytical person or an empathetic person or maybe a combination. If for whatever reason you're lacking on the action part, that's okay, but pair up with someone who is a doer so that you can share your ideas or your analysis of things and then work with them to get things done because that's one of the ways we can really ensure that our science is disseminated properly and that it actually takes hold. I could not believe the list of different things that Michelle talked about that she's doing in the UAE with colleagues. Obviously, she's not doing this all by herself, but it was just incredible to see, you know, I had to just put it all on one slide to really have that list going. And I'm sure there's things on here that I didn't even include that she's doing, but the, these are the ones that jumped out. So there was a, a large increase in the number of certificates, as I always, already mentioned, so she talked about how in 2015, there was 11 um, board certified behavior analysts. And in 2020, or sorry, there were 11 uh, companies. And in 2020, there was 22. Um, the number of analysts is increasing. Only three are Emirati though. I've already mentioned that. So one of the things that I would want to, if I could have a back and forth discussion with Michelle about it right now, would be to, to find out more about the efforts for increasing the number of Emiratis who are providing behavior analytic services. I know she mentioned the next thing is the, the verified course sequence. So that's at the, the university there. So that obviously is helpful to encourage they have the post-grad and the two-year master. So 
that should help improve the number of people locally that are going through the course sequence as well and learning about behavior analysis. I think another way that they can help increase the awareness, but also the use of behavior analysis within the UAE is the fact that Michelle and her colleagues are presenting at non-behavior analytic conferences. This is a really big action item that I think all of us can do better with as behavior analysts. I know I'm guilty of it myself. I've presented at one non-behavior analytic conference a couple years ago. It was a special education conference in Virginia and it was great, but I haven't really made as much of an effort as I should to present outside of just our state and national conferences. And well, I did present at an autism conference, a couple of autism conferences that weren't purely behavior analytic in nature, but really going outside of all of that and presenting at the types of conferences that Michelle talked about, like the different education conferences and the mental health conference. So getting that information out there and letting people even know, you know what behavior analysts are doing that obviously will improve the amount of people who not only know about it, but might seek careers in behavior analysis. Another action item that they're doing is the translation of materials. And I really loved how they had this set up with having the four different types of people, the parent, the student, the teacher, and the doctor, and trying to organize and categorize things in that way. I think that's one of the issues we run into a lot is we we want to get our science out there, but we don't think about the fact that there's different types of consumers of the information and we would need to have the materials prepared to connect with each of those different types of consumers. So I'm really excited to see this website when it's finished and hopefully Michelle and her colleagues can present or maybe even write a paper about the efforts that they put into that to help people replicate something like that in other languages as well. I also really enjoyed learning about the pediatricians and how they were studying what the pediatricians know about the different interventions for autism. I look forward to the follow-up research on that. It would be really helpful to know what there, you know, if there's some sort of way to, to kind of further educate them on the different treatments and how effective they are, maybe provide them with information from the National Autism Center's research that's done about these different interventions. One of the things that I thought about for connecting with the pediatricians that I wanted to point out is kind of looking at that evidence-based practice model. So that's a, an area that I present on and it's a passion area of mine. So when we talk about evidence-based practice, one way that we can try to connect with the medical field, whether it's in the UAE or elsewhere, is to come at it from the angle that they're familiar with. And there is research that, you know, we can tell them about, but if we really approach them from the same level of evidence-based practice, when behavior analysts talk about evidence-based practice versus when medical professionals talk about it, sometimes there's a difference because there's not a clear consensus in our field right now about what that even means to practice, <laughs> to have evidence-based practice. So to some people, Evidence-based practice is a list like the National Autism Center or the work from ASAT or other places like the um, What Works Clearinghouse to other people in our field. And I'm, I'm in the camp of the second piece is looking at it from the evidence-based practice model standpoint where you have a model of problem solving. So evidence-based practice means the research that's available, the client, and the individual client's needs and values, and then your clinical expertise. So it's a problem-solving model where you take into account those three things, and then you, de you decide upon your intervention based around that. So there are researchers in the field of behavior analysis, such as Susan Wolchinsky and um, Dr. Slocum, who have published information about how all behavior analysts should try to use an evidence-based practice model I know I'm going on a little bit of a tangent here, I apologize, but my thought when Michelle was describing the work they were doing with the pediatricians was most likely because this is a medical model, uh, when they talk to them more about evidence-based practice, if they can pull in and have that connection, you know, you all follow this model and this is how behavior analysis fits into it, then it may be more likely to make progress and especially helping them understand what things are empirically supported, so the various different interventions that Michelle's group asked them about, versus what things are not empirically supported. 
it might be easier to connect with the medical professionals if we talk about it from that language and refer to the full model of research, the client's individual needs, and the clinical expertise. The other thing that I really enjoyed learning about is the chapter for ABAI that they're working on getting finalized as well. I think, again, this is something that there are a lot of international chapters for ABAI, and hopefully we can encourage people to, you know, start their own chapters. Lastly, the thing that was most impressive to me was the work that Michelle talked about they were doing with the development um, of the field by working with the Ministry of Education. So that model that she talked about where they have the different levels of practicing behavior analysts and how it would be different based on years of experience and who's supervising who and who's responsible for who was just phenomenal. And I think, especially with the changes that are happening with the board right now, that having something similar like that happening in each country, depending on what their resources are, will be really important. So I really implore you, Michelle, to please disseminate as much of that as you can to your colleagues around the world so that they can see that that looks like a really great example of how people in different countries can work with their governments to create a system to support the growth of behavior analysis that's done in an ethical and effective manner. And then I did just want to make sure to mention one more time that Michelle, one of the ways that they are growing and disseminating information about behavior analysis is the Facebook group. So I really like that ABA Middle East exists. I've met a lot of wonderful people through that group. So thank you for moderating that, Michelle. The next discussion point is the paper from Dr. Merritt Shank on sports. So I had to just have a slide with this quote because I wrote it down and I drew a big circle around and it just really excited me. So Merritt said, use behavior analysis around the game that exists. And I just can't think of a better way to talk about what we need to do in our field, especially when we're looking at disseminating. So not all of us are working in sports, not all of us are working around a game that already exists, but you could replace game with whatever environment you're in. So use behavior analysis around the family that already exists, around the school that already exists, around the company that already exists. So it's our job as behavior analysts to go into the environment that we're serving and use our science within that. It's not our job to go in and try to change the game that already exists. So I just really thought that was a great take home point that we should all have at the forefront of our minds when we're thinking about the work we do as behavior analysts. Some of the points that Merritt made that I wanted to highlight. So the first was that his research did indicate, you know, even when working on tackles, which is like, as he mentioned, or really fast, it happens in one second type activity, their research supported the previous research that's been done on behavioral skills training, that feedback is an essential component. So some of the participants made a little bit of progress with just the antecedent manipulation of providing, you know, the modeling and the rehearsal but it wasn't until they added the feedback that they really saw that checklist and their performance go up higher for the safe tackling. And this is you know, pretty prevalent in the behavioral skills training literature. One of the things that I was wondering about when Merritt was talking was what it would look like to add tag teach to this process. So Merritt and his colleagues are wonderful experts on sports and behavioral skills training, especially that he trained with Dr. Milton Berger for his doctorate, but I have also attended trainings that have been done from the tag teach realm, but usually people in tag teach are behavior analysts. Some are board certified, some aren't, and they work on, you know, using the clicker to indicate whether or not the tag point was met. So I was thinking about that with the safe tackling and Merritt mentioned, like, it's such a fast thing that happens and giving that feedback and how shaping could be used with that checklist and having your tag point and clicking and really shaping up their performance to get that quick feedback based on what they need to work on from their checklist. So not sure if that's an area of future research for you, Merritt, or if you have any friends who would want to look at that, but that was something that came to mind that I think would be really interesting to study if you can improve their performance on the checklist by tying in 
feedback based around tag teach. I also loved that Merritt pointed out, you know, he didn't, he's obviously outside of autism and he encouraged everyone to, you know, if you're not doing something that you're passionate about, that you love, find it, find what you love and, and go after it. It's easier to find jobs in our field right now around autism and developmental disabilities, but that doesn't mean it's the only thing. So if there's other areas that you're passionate about, learn the science and then join those areas or vice versa, learn the area and then learn the science. I do think the point he made about learning the literature is really important. So whether you, you've been in the field for a really long time or you're newer to the field, whatever population you're serving, if we want to be ambassadors to our science, you need to learn the literature for that population, not just the behavior analytic literature, but all of the literature that is obviously well designed. You don't have to read, you know, junk science or anything. Can be helpful to know what you're up against, but you know, at the very least, reading things outside of just our journals to see, to learn more about it. So if Merritt had only focused on the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis and sports, he probably wouldn't find very much, but there's sports psychology journals where he can look up information and there's other journals in psychology that he can learn more about what's going on in the sports realm. And that's where he's going to be able to make the most progress. So don't limit yourself. If um, even though we have a lot of publications in Java around verbal behavior and autism and language and skill development, that doesn't mean again, that that's all we should be reading. We need to be looking at all of the literature with whatever population we're serving so we can make sure we're synthesizing everything and, and coming up with the best interventions possible. When Merritt says, he, it's a longer quote that he provided from Nelson Mandela, but he said, sport has the power to change the world. And I really liked that quote. It really made me think of B.F. Skinner's quote, why are we not acting to save the world? So hopefully his presentation helped everyone think about how we can combine what he's learned from working in sports, which is outside of what a typical behavior analyst would do, and figure out better ways to act to save the world with behavior analysis. And then the last paper that was presented was Whitney Hamill, Ani, from um, talking about the work that she's doing in Africa. So I've already mentioned some of these things, but what I noticed with her presentation that I think we all need to be aware of, the, bit, the first thing that she talked about, which was the stigmas that exist in Africa around disability. And that's, you know, whether you're working in Africa or working anywhere, we do need to understand that not everyone is to the point of accepting and, and advocating for equal treatment or happy lives for people with disabilities. Even in the States, you still see, if you ever read the comments on anything relating to disability, there will be people commenting about, you know, how they're a drain on the system and we shouldn't be doing anything. So the stigmas are alive, unfortunately, and well, but they're definitely more prevalent and, and more dangerous in certain areas. And that's really important to understand if you're trying to disseminate our science and work in different cultures, it's important to understand the whole culture around whatever you're trying to do, whether it's work with disabilities or anything else with our science. Another thing that Whitney talked about, which was the barriers for disseminating our science in Africa, I think these barriers probably exist at some level in every part of the world, even here. Um, one was the cost, so the cost of going to school and learning about it. Um, the employment opportunities, there's not as many employment opportunities in our field. And the access to supervision and the exams. One of the things I was wondering is with the change with the BACB, if any of these will become bigger barriers or if maybe they'll become lower barriers. I think we have a unique opportunity right now, hopefully for the people living in different countries to do something similar to what Michelle is doing and really look at the framework and the resources and the system that exists around them and figure out how to get rid of these barriers. Is it possible to set up new systems and help grow behavior analysis based around what currently exists in that country? Because it's possible that prior to the BACB's decision to change how they're certifying people, there was a maybe an 
idea that we were kind of locked in to just becoming BCBAs. I'm not saying that that's not worth pursuing, but maybe this opens the door for people to kind of break out of the mold a little bit and think about what their own individual country would need and benefit from the most. Maybe it's doing like what Michelle mentioned and working to uh, create a system and then talk to the BACB about certification, or maybe it's creating completely their own system and promoting things completely locally. It'll probably depend. I think we'll see a lot of different models come out in the next few years based around that change. I really, really loved hearing that they're providing scholarships to people in Ghana to work within our field. I just want to commend you for doing that. I think that's wonderful. And I can't wait to see that continue to grow. And I hope everyone that's watching this presentation takes a moment to check out Whitney's nonprofit NGO, Autism Compassion Africa, to help support them in providing those scholarships and creating that training for the individuals locally. As Whitney mentioned, there's some different ways that you could help with her, their efforts there. So providing support to, um, to the nonprofit hers or any other that's doing something similar. Um, being willing to provide mentorship, maybe at a lower cost than typical, helping to you know support people that want to learn more about our science but are already up against some barriers, um, and potentially move. I put a question mark there. You, I, would, I would recommend doing it for the right reason. So if it's just because you don't wanna live in America anymore and you wanna travel the world, um, think about what I talked about earlier in the presentation regarding going to places and doing with not for and making sure that you really want to go somewhere and learn about the culture and learn from the people there and work with them and that you're not wanting to just go and, and try to put your own <laughs> ideas into whatever area you're moving to. So what does this mean for you? We, we're closing out our symposium. We had three wonderful presentations about how to break out side of um, America and or autism. And what can this set up? What do we want you to do after watching this symposium? So one of the things I think you should do is ask yourself, what expertise do you have that you can share with others? And then, and then try to connect with people and share that information. How will you share it? Will you use some of the strategies that I talked about earlier? Will you emulate some of the things that Whitney, Michelle, and Merritt talked about that they're doing? Do you have your own ideas of how you will share it? And then we all have gaps too. So what gaps do you have and how will you fill them? Will you connect with people from around the world or in different areas of our science that are working with populations that you're not working with? That's a, that could be a good way to fill those gaps. Don't be afraid to take the leap and put yourself out there and really start connecting with others. So here are some ways you can take action. You can get involved. These are some of the things that I try to be involved with. PACA, which is the Pan-African Congress on Autism. It's a group that was started by parents. The Global Autism Project that I mentioned earlier, international chapters for behavior analysis, the Autism Compassion Africa that Whitney already mentioned. Connect, look for different Facebook groups in different parts of the world relating to behavior analysis, but also relating to different areas. So if you like health and fitness, join some health and fitness groups and then try to infuse our science into that. If you're really interested in parenting, join some regular parenting groups and infuse our science into that. So whatever your passions are, try to join those groups and connect with people. There's also some really great Instagram pages by different people within our science that you can follow and learn more ideas about how to disseminate. And then lastly, converse with people, but mostly listen. So if you're talking to people that live in areas that you don't live in or work in um, with populations you don't work with or use, maybe even aren't behavior analysts, they work with the same population, but they're not a behavior analyst, listen, see what you can learn from them. Try not to just teach them everything you know, but sit back and listen to what they have to say. All right, and now we'll see what questions people have who are watching the presentation live. Thank you.